I couldn't think of a better introduction to my half of the talk. And as you'll see, the, there's great overlap, both congruence of ideas and of challenges. Um, <clears throat> I'm really a cancer biologist who's focused on signal transduction issues. And as you know, the premise of the signal transduction folks for the last many years has been that all we need to do now that we basically understand the pathways that are dysregulated in cancers is type each one, identify the pathways uh, that are activated in each cancer, starting with the drivers, in this case the wind pathway, in this case some receptor activating the RAS pathway, and then come in with drugs either targeting the drivers or some downstream component on the pathways. And then we get these drugs into patients, and it's just a clinical problem at that point, and we can all go home. And the good news, of course, is that um, we understand a lot about the pathways, we're getting better at better at typing patients and DNA sequences, extraordinarily cheap. But on the other hand, there's kind of a half empty, half full glass situation here. Among the targeted drugs, we have one fantastic drug, imatinib uh, Gleevec, which really does what we want to be able to do with all of our cancers. You, it's easy to select the right patients. The vast majority of patients treated with that drug for CML do respond, and those responses are durable. Then, on the other hand, uh, 11 years after the first targeted drug, Herceptin, was approved by the FDA, we have a number of drugs in the category, including Herceptin, including Aresa, including Avastin. These are targeted drugs that really do help patients, and all of you who are clinicians are using subsets of these drugs. Unfortunately, <coughs> The drugs don't work as well as a drug like Gleevec does. They're not giving durable responses, even where we can carefully select patients, as we can do for Herceptin and HER2 amplification. A subset of those patients, in the case of Herceptin, half of them don't respond to the drug. And then, of course, we're not getting the durable responses, even with great drugs like Aresa, that we really want on the majority of treated patients. So. <clears throat> There's much more work to be done. And a number of practical problems have uh, been identified through the bench uh, to bedside and then bedside back to bench experience we have, especially with the receptor-targeted drugs. Um, one issue, of course, is that every cancer is unique. So we do need genetic and, I would argue, functional profiling for every patient's cancer to determine the best treatment. There's extraordinary genetic plasticity and heterogeneity, especially among solid tumors, and this is a problem we don't have with CML. There's cellular heterogeneity within the tumors, including, of course, cancer stem cells. Uh, both de novo and acquired, uh, upfront and required resistance uh, is often associated with bypass mutations or pathway mutations. And the good news, again, is that we can anticipate some of these, such as P10 or AKT activating mutations and then maybe come in up front uh, in advance. On the other hand, things like growth factor activation of receptors is harder both to measure and anticipate and is a practical clinical problem. Uh, finally, the, the signaling pathways we're targeting are themselves resilient in the sense that if you hit them in one place, uh, there are feedback mechanisms that uh, respond. And this is true of all cellular processes, so it's not a big surprise to any of us who are biologists. Here's an example from Neil Rosen's work a couple of years ago with breast cancer, where this is the AKT signaling pathway. He came in with rapamycin to inhibit mTOR. Rapamycin's effective. It knocks out mTOR signaling, reduces P70SX kinase signaling. But as a secondary consequence, you're reducing a negative feedback loop that's tonically active in these cells between P70 and IRS1 in this case. The result is increased signaling through RS1, through PI3 kinase to AKT. And even though you're knocking down this arm of AKT signaling, an uh, unwanted uh, effect is that you're upregulating signaling through these other arms of the AKT pathways. We know that there will be many, many homeostatic mechanisms of this sort. And we can, again, either wait until we understand them all, which might take some time, or just uh, try and get around them. Uh, here's an example that Tom brought up in his talk, and this is a, a case which, again, is, is increasingly common as we're learning more about solid tumors in any case, which is the presence of multiple powerful drivers. Uh, 
how is MET and EGF receptor activity discovered in lung cancers? Well, one of the ways it came from our lab and from Yanni's lab was simply by profiling activation of receptor kinases in different lung cancer cell lines. Here's the work that Sina Agrawal did with us and Mike DiGiovanna. And the idea is you have an array that captures different receptor kinases from extracts of tumor cells. And then you can probe these filters with antiphosphotyrosine, which only detects the receptors that are activated. And what Sima found in this work was that in this line and this line, only the EGF receptor, and in this case, EGF receptor or B2. But in this cell line, H441, there was another blob, and that is actually active MET. Now, a couple of labs found this at the same time, and the important thing is that to really hit these cells hard, you have to hit them with both MET inhibitors and with ERB inhibitors. And that's easy to do. In fact, MET and ERB inhibitors are in clinical trials. But in your patient, you need to know that this is happening up front. And one interesting thing about this approach is that this was an unbiased screen. We didn't know up front what to expect would come out of these filters. But in fact, in these tumor cell lines, we identified two active receptors that do turn out to be important just in the cell line. So it suggests a functional strategy. So the general thing you want to do, ideally, with adequate resources and personnel is uh, take a, a kind of cancer disease, do molecular and functional analyses patient by patient, both to identify drivers, identify patterns that are disease specific. And one thing we are learning is that some diseases do have very strong patterns and others like lung cancer are extremely heterogeneous and then identify causes of drug sensitivities and start learning how to anticipate drug resistance up front so you can hit hard from the beginning. And finally, of course, distill this work for clinical practice. Um, <clears throat> although we've mainly worked in breast cancer here because of our interest in herbs, uh, about a year and a half ago, enticed by pilot funding, we joined up with the Yale Sport on skin cancer. Ruth Haliband's the PI. There are many people involved in this. And the foundation for this spore is a bank now encompassing over 200 melanoma tumors collected in collaboration with Steve Arian and others. And with this tumor material, which is all linked to clinical data, we can already, of course, do standard things like exon sequencing, copy number analysis, and transcription profiling. But what's really unique about this resource, thanks to Ruth's work, is that she, her laboratory has been producing early passage dissociated cell cultures from these melanomas as they're banked. This is a truly unique resource, uh, really worldwide. Not only is it difficult to find cell lines that are linked to tumor materials, but secondly, it turns out that among solid tumors, plating efficiencies of dissociated melanomas are very high, which means probably that those tumor cell cultures are much more similar to the tumor resources from which they were derived than are the cell cultures we work with in lung and breast and other cell tumors. And having these cell cultures means we can do some things that are not easy to do even on fresh tumor material. One is to I, analyze very deeply signaling activities at the receptor and pathway levels. And the second thing we can do is functional testing because these are cell lines. We can put them into screening assays. And so what I'm going to tell you about is how the SPORE and uh, members of our laboratory are using this whole process to assemble what we think is an ideal data set that will both help us learn more about what causes melanomas, but also more generally identify ways of analyzing tumors and linking them to mutational, transcriptional, and functional data. So our laboratory is focusing on the signaling analyses and with the idea being that if the pathway is active in your tumor, it's probably doing something. And it's also, of course, a therapeutic target. And we've been using a couple of different platforms to evaluate pathway signaling activity. One are these filter arrays that I just showed you, which have the advantage of being low cost and fast and I'd say moderately accurate. There are other uh, platforms being used to analyze these same cell cultures. One is Harriet uh, Kluber's collaboration to do a reverse phase pathway anal analysis on a subset, which is higher cost, greater precision, probably greater accuracy. And then we have a collaboration with Ting Gu at Cell Signaling Technologies, who's taking a subset of these cultures 
and doing tandem mass spectrometry. This is a true discovery level kind of assay, which is highly accurate, um, but has sensitivity and sampling issues. And then the uh, idea is to basically take these platforms and analyze a reference set. We're building out to about 60 cell strains. We've uh, made a lot of progress on about 25 of them. So our first work has been looking at the receptors themselves, both because receptor kinases are common drivers in cancer, also because, of course, they're excellent therapeutic targets. And as I mentioned, we can use these receptor capture arrays. These are on cell strains. You can actually also do them on tumor extracts. This is just an example of two different melanoma cultures, one of which has KIT active and MET active. The other one has HER3 active. You can see these patterns are very different. Both of them have IGF-1 receptor activation. Um, this is just a summary of work. Uh, each column here is a different cell line. And then moving across, we have the different receptors. And we can start looking at these and looking for patterns. Uh, with this work, we have to do technical validations, which is to confirm the hits, uh, which is done by Western blotting. And sometimes the tandem mass spec hits we're getting from cell signaling technologies match up to the receptors we're looking at here. And the most important thing, though, is biological validation, which is still in progress. But this, again, is something we can do with the system. Once we have gone through this triage process and identified the molecules we're most interested in, then having candidates, it is practical to go back to the frozen tumor specimens or the paraffin blocks associated with these tumors and show and know for sure whether what we're looking at is a tissue culture artifact, and some of these probably are, or in fact was a, an inherent feature of the uh, tumor of origin. And that's a very important kind of practical knowledge one simply cannot have with standard tumor cell lines. So this is work by Kat Tworkowski, again, just showing that we can validate these things we're looking at, and we do nice Western blots. And I just want to give you a sense of the kinds of information we're already developing out of this data set after really only a year of work. First of all, among the receptors we're finding active, we're commonly finding activation of MET and KIT, that's these two rows here. This is with untreated cell cultures. These cell cultures are pretreated with preventidate to ramp up endogenous tyrosine phosphorylation. Um, and you can see just looking across that MET and KIT are sometimes activated in these tumors. This was expected because both MET and KIT signaling have already been reported in melanoma. We also often found insulin and IGF-1 receptor activation. That's what these two green blobs are here. And again, more with pervanidate. This gets us into a kind of a dicey area because the agonist, IGF-1, is, is very prominent in serum. But with serum starvation experiments, it is beginning to look like a subset of these at least are real. And as many of you know, IGF-1 receptor is an authentic breast cancer signaling target, which Mike DiGiovanna will talk about in the signaling meeting today at 5. And the most exciting thing, though, is we have identified some receptor activations that have never before been linked to melanoma. And these suggest new therapeutic targets. One of them, looking across here in purple, is ERB3. Very, very common, especially with pervanidate, but these have been validated without. And also another receptor, which I won't name right now because we're too excited about it. Um, <laughs> So as I mentioned, another way of collecting signaling information, and this is a relatively unbiased approach, is to basically uh, collect proteins from tumor cells or tumor cell lines, and CST is doing both for us, and then purify a subset of phosphopeptides, either with antiphosphotyrosine or with cell signaling technologies, batteries of different protein kinase substrate family antibodies. And the runs we've completed so far have been with antiphosphotyrosine, which turned out not to be that informative, and with antibodies that collect consensus AKT phosphorylation sites, which produce a huge amount of data. And again, the inspiration for this was work that they had originally published on lung cancer, where only a few years ago, looking at lung tumors and cell lines, they identified not only receptors that had been linked to lung cancer before, but other receptors, including ALK, which Tom mentioned, which had not previously been linked to lung cancer, and they validated some of these. So this is a genuine discovery method. We're, we're coming in without any bias. Uh, and again, we're identifying receptors and signaling proteins active in these tumors, 
An important component of this work is the direct comparison of phosphopeptides in tumors and cell cultures. And they are certainly finding many differences. But this gives us a, a beginning of a handle on what those differences are and what to be concerned about. And again, the major hope, though, is to identify new patterns and therapeutic targets. So uh, as I mentioned, we're not just interested in receptors. The signaling proteins activated by the receptors are equally important. And in melanoma, for example, uh, one commonly finds activating mutations in the intermediary kinase BRAF and also sometimes NRAS. So uh, Rahul Dalal in my lab and Garima uh, Singhal have been, again, taking this uh, quick and dirty filter approach as a first pass on signaling molecules. It's the same idea. Here's an example of a cell strain that has a lot of beta catenin and protein. This is not a phosphorylation. And this is one that has phospho-AKT. And you can see these patterns are different, and they're reproducible. So again, we generate lots of data. Some of this is garbage, and some of it isn't. And that's why Rahul has done a lot of validations. And we know from validating target by target that we can trust some of these spots more than others. Uh, so for example, our CHECK2 data don't look so great. But on the other hand, a lot of proteins like phospho-IKT, phospho-ERK, beta-catene in total, these are validating very well in Westerns, and we can trust them more. And then what we can do is start trying to assemble these data. Um, I, I know you probably can't read these. I can barely see them, too. But the idea is that each column, each group of uh, columns on this histograms is a different cell culture. And these different colors represent different signaling targets. And the idea is now that we have a survey of these things that are validated, we can start trying to assemble them into pathways. For example, these hot colors are proteins that are all on the AKT signaling pathway. And where they are co-activated, you can believe the data more. Mm -hmm. And second, we can already start to try and correlate activations with the presence of mutations. So these Rs down here are cell strains that Ruth's lab has shown have activating N, uh, BRAF mutations. And in fact, uh, they, these cells uh, are also enriched among the subset that have high ERK signaling. Uh, the importance, though, of course, is that these should predict drug sensitivities, and that's eventually where we're going with this. So this is just to give you a visual impression of the huge piles of data we're getting from the phospho-AKT results from cell signaling. Each one of these columns is a cell line. Each one of these rows, and not just cell lines, I should say, half of these are cell lines, and half of these are direct frozen tumor material. And each one of these rows is a different phosphopeptide that's been identified by mass spec. And there's some concordances. And again, to a limited extent, we're seeing overlap among the phosphopeptides detected by the arrays and by the uh, quick and dirty uh, uh, blotting and signaling methods. So and here's where we can begin to assemble these data line by line by line. First column <laughs> is the, the array. And then uh, the next few columns are the blots. And then the final columns are hits with the phosphopeptides by mass spec. So this is work in progress, for sure. But I want to give you a sense of where this is all headed, even just at the descriptive level. This is just a tabulation of one of the receptors we're working on. Here the cell lines are shown in rows. And the first two columns here are just the uh, receptor phosphorylation for this receptor, either without or with pervanidate, scored with numbers. And then we can add to these data uh, by looking at the data from the Western blotting and total Western <coughs> blots and start to get a sense of how well signaling correlates with validated phosphorylation and total protein expression. And here's a case where the mass spec picked up some of the same phosphopeptides. And then we can continue that by starting to think about mechanism. Why are these receptors active in these cells? And one thing we can get right off of the transcription profiles is the extent of transcription of the gene for this receptor in all these cell lines. These numbers in the, the low to mid hundreds would be considered low level expression. And on the other hand, you can easily pick out these numbers in the tens of thousands. And interestingly, the activity of the receptor more or less associates with the amount of transcript. Not only that, in the same spreadsheets, we can look to see whether the single major agonist for this particular receptor 
whether its transcription is associated with receptor expression. In this case, it certainly is. So in this case, in general, where we have high receptor transcription, we also have high ligand transcription. And we don't know yet which is the chicken and which is the egg, but probably this is an example of an autoactivation loop, an autocrine loop within these tumor cells. And having this hypothesis, of course, it's easy to test, and that's what we're doing. Okay, so the final piece of this project, of course, is functional testing. And this, again, is something you cannot do unless you have tumors linked to cell cultures. And the idea is uh, piecemeal already we're taking predictions from the signaling data and trying to predict responses either by using drugs to target pathway components. Here's an example of bosutinib knocking down phospho-AKT, which also correlates with inhibition of phospho-ERB3, or using conventional growth, uh, cell growth assay endpoints as well. And <clears throat> The direction this is going in is basically the same, except we want to focus very strongly on drug combinations. For all the reasons I've told you, it's very clear that even if you're just looking at signaling, hitting one pathway or possibly even a, even a single target within a pathway will not be sufficient to keep these tumors from growing. So the basic idea, and this is work we're doing in collaboration with Marcus Bosenberg, who's sitting right down here, is to take all of this signaling and genetic data as it rolls in, and then we'll take a panel of cell strains, which is Ruth's preferred term for these different cell cultures, and we know again which pathways and which gene mutations are present in each of these cell strains. Then what we try and do, as you can imagine, is pick out our best guess of what are the best targeted receptors and intermediary signaling molecules that would be associated with those cell strains. And that's the beginning of our panel. The rest of our panels, though, will be more generic. And this is because, A, we don't know really what it takes to kill these things, and B, and as a way of getting at unidentified crosstalk between pathways and un unidentified feedback loops within pathways. So the idea is to fill out this panel with broad specificity pathway active drugs for pathways we generally know are important, cell cycle active drugs, maybe pro-hypotonic drugs, and other broad range uh, epigenetic modifiers, and also conventional genotoxic and mitotic uh, spindle apparatus targeted drugs. Um, so now we have a panel uh, for each of these cell strains of about 20 different drugs. And then we want to start running combinations of these drugs on these cell lines. And if you work it out, if you, if you have a two-way panel, if you have two-way combinations, there are 190 unique combinations in a panel of 20, 11, 40, three-way, and 48, 45 for a four-way. And that's only at a single dose, of course, for each. So it's a lot of combinations. And just making this PowerPoint was a very tedious uh, <laughs> operation. <laughs> that you can see I, I kind of got sick of when I was doing on Sunday. So the trick is not to um, use a huge army of lab workers, but to, in fact, make use of our robot friends to do all the hard and tedious work. And this is work we're going to be doing in collaboration with Lars Brandon at the Yale Center for High Throughput Cell Biology, which is already in place and looking for customers at the Yale West Campus. And one thing robots are very good at, in addition to taking one cell line and screening 300,000 drugs at it, another thing you can do very readily with these robots is take larger numbers of cell strains and set up these very complicated panels, which would be very difficult to do with strictly human labor. So the long, uh, the short range work, a at the signaling level, uh, we're extending out the phospho family profiling, and that's work in, that's in collaboration with cell signaling, both by blotting, which we're identifying the best candidates, and then they're doing tandem mass spec. I'm very interested in the tumor cell comparisons and in the drug predictions. A second line of work is to start taking the interesting drugs and running these same kinds of analyses and look to see what the impact is on the endogenous signaling pathways. And that, again, is a way of getting a sense of what the homeostatic mechanisms are that we're trying to uh, anticipate. 
And again, in the long run, there is a lot of work going on within the sport at both the receptor level, the signaling level, the mass spec level. And I haven't talked about the very important but crucial work that's going on at the sequencing level that's just beginning. In the long term, though, the piece I'm most excited about is being able to integrate the functional work with all the genetic and signaling analysis. So this is a big collaborative effort. Among the people in my lab who have been involved in this are Garima Singhal, uh, an Indian PhD student, Tina Zito, who's been a, a postdoc and superdoc in my lab for a long time, Katwar Koski, a graduate student, Tashika Steed, a new postdoc, Rahul is a Yale undergraduate, Natalia was resident this, uh, visiting this summer, Kelly's a high school student, and then the uh, resequencing DNA uh, capture work, which I didn't get to discuss today, was spearheaded by Neil Desai, a medical student. It's now carried through by Alexandra in collaboration with Mike Snyder's lab. None of this work would be possible without the uh, cell strains produced and managed by Ant Antonella in Ruth Halliband's lab and without the vast resources of the Yale spore. Uh, Michael Krauthammer and Jim McCusker for informatics and our collaborators at Cell Signaling. Uh, the money for all this came from a spore from the Rosalind and Jeremy Meyer Fund, Harold Lloyd's funding signaling work in our lab. The Melanoma Research Alliance is about to fund this huge sequencing effort, possibly running out to 75 genomes here. And we have funding from an anonymous uh, source for our work with Marcus. Thank you. <coughs> That clock is fast. That clock's It's fast. only seven minutes of one. Seven minutes of one. So two things. What you saw today was the idea of balancing a uh, science talk, <coughs> clinical talk. We also have population science talks. Before David takes a question, I, I admit thanking three very important people. Francine Foss, uh, Marcus Bosenberg, and Melinda Irwin. We're critical in putting together the slate of speakers for this program. So I want to just express our thanks to them for their efforts to put this together. Terrific job. Questions. Questions. David. Rob. So, phenomenally complicated. Is there any possible way that we can actually find pattern in this? I'm That's the know. hope. The hope of this whole screening thing is suddenly Marcus and I will look at the data and go, wait a minute, look. But we don't know. Uh, nobody's done this before. That's a hope. Ah, great question. Yes, can you use this sort of technology to figure out what cell lines are actually good representative? All, all the grown-ups in this room know that people have been testing tumor cell lines for the past 40 years, and the result, even with the NCI panel, has been extremely disappointing. Having said that, there's hope, um, and for a couple of different reasons. First of all, in this case, we have cell strains that are very they are few passages distant from the melanomas they started with. Secondly, uh, as I mentioned, there's a very high plating efficiency of melanoma, and that differs from all the epithelial solid tumors we're used to working with. They haven't gone through crisis, crisis and most of the cells you played out survive. They're very stemmy. Thirdly, and this is something different, most of the NCI panel work has been done with conventional broad spectrum cell cycle active and genotoxic drugs. And those are exactly the kinds of drugs that you might not expect to get as much information from cell cultures. One thing you can measure very easily in cell cultures is the response of a targeted drug that hits a signaling molecule that's doing something very specific to almost any endpoint you can measure that's affected by that pathway. And that's something I would argue that we can do a lot more accurately uh, in tissue culture than we can predict a response to a genotoxic drug. And in fact, with the lung cancers and even with breast cancer, there has been a better connection, I would say, between the receptor and pathway targeted drugs in the cell lines matching to the tumors than again with the genotoxic drugs. On that question, I mean, the melanoma is a nice system and it's a proof of concept. But do you 
Right, 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 right. So the, and then you use the information yeah. to know how So it John's works. asking whether, whether we can extend this to other solid tumors. And the answer yeah, is, exactly. conceptually, a pathway is a pathway, a cell is a cell, a target is a target. So if we're, poor, you know, if this is the way the world is, then even though we're using melanoma as a test bed, the hope would be that we can, once we extract out the most important elements from the data we end up with, it will be applicable to all cancer signaling. But I'm a cancer signaling guy. This is, we just don't know yet. But that's the lines, I think it still has to be, I mean, I think a lot of us have hope that we'll be reclassifying tumors, not as lung or melanoma, but as, but as V600E rat wounds, and as exon 19 EGFR deletions, and as, as KRAS mutants. So, but it still hasn't been proven to me conclusively that that's going to be the case. And what you want to see, and, and the Fluxicon compound may be the first one to do this, the drug that has activity against the rat mutation. When that drug gets looked at in BRAF mutated lung and BRAF mutated colorectal cancer, see the same kind of responses, that would be very encouraging. With the EGFR mutants and other disease types, it's been sketchy. There's been some responses, some haven't. But, but John, the whole hope is that signaling that's applicable to melanoma should be applicable yeah. to other But, but then there's a challenge. We have to go forward to be practical, I think, is if it is just sequence here, it's activity. It's right, and so this is something I didn't say explicitly. What, what do you minimum, measure? The minimum number of set that you need to measure right. all the points on and the the, and to figure out where yeah, and this is something I've, I'm very sensitive to, in fact, which is why we developed tyrosine phosphopeptide antibodies, because the hope was if you could measure signaling, which is the phenotype you're after, that would be great. One thing we hope to be able to do with this data set, once we, un once we see how it performs, is to fill out, again, the minimal number of observations from these different platforms, and it will have to be multi-platform, that you need to make a strong prediction. Whether we succeed or not, uh, we don't know. But that's, that's certainly the other challenge, of course, is that you're going to have to continue to commit to five analysis. Yeah. Well, how many platforms are you going to need? Well, it, the yeah, so this, I'll give you my opinion. Uh, so if you look at her, her two or the herbs as, uh, just as an example, you can activate the EGF receptor with a mutation. It's easy to recognize activating mutations, and where the mutations are present, they have very strong predictive value. On the other hand, if Mut indels and substitutions do not encompass all of the biologically important EGF receptor activations in cancers. In fact, even in lung, retrospective data suggests that looking at gene amplification in some tumors has predictive value independently of mutation. So that's two. If you look at HER2, where we just know a lot more about the biology, it's clear that Commonly in breast cancer, it's activated by overexpression. In lung cancer, sometimes by similar mutations. But we know that in many cases, you activate, the normal way to activate these receptors is through growth factor stimulation. You can measure expression of the growth factors, but they're actually activated by proteolytic cleavage of the propeptides, and that's something impossible to measure. So this is going to be very difficult. Either we're going to need a lot of fu functional data to collect everything, or eventually we'll learn how to interpret transcription profiling in such a way as to infer signaling, and we'll see. Or maybe in most cases it will be driven by mutations. Any DNA or RNA change, we can measure pretty well. It's the functional stuff that's yeah. One more question, Tom. Yeah. yeah, it was brought up a tumor heterogeneity. I just wonder if those cells mm -hmm. grew up, uh, how heterogeneous they are to begin with. I don't know. Yeah, the genius mm -hmm. to begin with. So what's the meaning of all those data? Because you simply <coughs> reflect the different population of the cell. Yeah. So the short answer to that is, I don't know. Uh, Ruth may have a comment. The second answer is that in general, melanoma cultures have a very high stem cell component. Um, so people have shown that as as many as 100% in Marcus's hands of short-term melanoma cultures have tumor reconstituting activity. It's also a general, general fact for melanoma in contrast to breast cancer, for example, that the tumors aren't characterized by a lot of stromal infiltration, which is a whole other can of worms. So they may not be perfect. This may not be the best data set, but this is the best one we could possibly hope to work with at this point. I just wonder 
And in terms of if there is heterogeneity, whether it will be meaningful, that's a practical issue. It's the quite, if you can hit the tumors hard enough up front, in other words, if you can outpace the selection for the subset that's resistant, then you will improve therapy. If you can't, we're screwed, and that's just the way it is. Um, and what a, what a perfect way to okay. finish. Okay. <laughs> Guys, thank you very much. See you next week.